Hi, I'm Aaron Sodickson from Brigham Women's Hospital. I'll be speaking today about electronic medical record dose history extraction and monitoring for patient safety. Uh, as a general question, why would we want to do dose extraction in the EMR? There are many different reasons that we might uh, be interested in doing this. The first is, at a broad level, a scientific question. We can use this information to test or to refine our models of the biological effects of radiation at low dose. The next general, uh, general reason for doing this is regulatory oversight. This allows us to capture data that can be useful for equipment uh, and practice performance monitoring. We can do the same at an organizational or institutional level. Uh, where we can benchmark against other institutions or uh, between facilities in our uh, organization. We can use this data for quality improvement, for patient safety uh, reasons. At the equipment and scanner level, we can think about quality assurance, we can think about technique optimization. And finally, at the patient specific level, we can think about doing longitudinal dose monitoring and risk assessment uh, in the electronic medical record, which may be useful in making better informed decision making going forward. Uh, for those of you who heard my session two talk, I, I used this slide there, but just to reiterate, I like to think about risk from ionizing radiation as a drop in the bucket. The risk from any individual CT scan is relatively small, but we need to understand how large is this bucket of risk, how full is it at baseline, and how rapidly are we adding to it both with the size of the drops, the, the dose that we're imparting from our CT scans, and with the frequency of utilization of these CT scans. What do we know about low-dose radiation risks? A lot of this comes from uh, the survivors of the atomic bombs. Um, and the red data here shows that for certain dose ranges, we have statistically uh, convincing, statistically significant increases in risk of cancer development in patients who received uh, doses above a certain amount. But as we get down to the lower dose realm here, which is where we're doing most of our diagnostic imaging in CT, there's a lot of uncertainty about what this dose response curve looks like. And as a result, there have been many different proposed models. The most commonly used assumption is the linear no threshold model in red here, where we assume that if we double the radiation dose, we double the risk to the patient of developing a subsequent cancer. Now one of the things we clearly need is we need better validated risk models. And one way to do this would be to capture better data in this low dose realm to try to directly test uh, our dose response curves uh, and see what fits uh, reality. To do this, we would need accurate dosimetry in a large number of patients in order to try to detect a very small increase in cancer incidence above the very large baseline cancer incidence of 42% in a US population. And some of the informatics methods that I'll be discussing are one way to get at this sort of large-scale dose capture and to allow us to do some testing of our underlying risk models. This is a survey we did several years ago at our institution, just counting how many CT scans each of our patients had had. And while you see that many of our patients have had a relatively slow, a small number of CT scans, there's this long right-handed tail, and we have actually several patients who have a really staggering number of CT scans in their medical record history, um, with about 1% of our patients having 38 CT scans or more in the 22-year history we have records of. Now, if we look at one of these frequent flyer patients, as I sometimes call them, we have the red dots here mapped to the left-hand axis, which is looking at an estimated cumulative effective dose with each dot representing an additional CT scan. The blue dots use the most common linear no threshold model out there, the BEAR-7 model, to try to estimate what's the attributable, lifetime attributable risk, the additional risk that this patient might have of developing a cancer due to our imaging. And that's what these blue dots show. And if our BEAR-7 risk model is correct, we estimate that in this patient we may have imparted roughly a 10% excess cancer risk over time from all of our prior imaging. Now, a lot of this imaging, if you dig down into this patient's history, actually didn't really contribute a whole lot to her medical care, which makes us wonder if we can do image her better uh, over time. Of course, the story doesn't end here. If we do nothing and if her clinical situation continues to be similar, she'll continue to come in with her similar symptoms. We'll continue to image her as we have in the past, and we can actually accrue fairly substantial 
cumulative doses and associated risks. Here, estimated to be on the order of 25%. So I think it's very helpful to think about this sort of picture to try to take a, a long-term view of our patients. How can we better uh, image our patients over time, depending, of course, on their clinical scenario? And if, for example, we image this patient as half as often or a quarter as often, as you see here, we can really flatten out these curves. Now, there are many opportunities to uh, reduce radiation dose to our patients. Um, others in the session, in the symposium, have talked about what we can do before the scan to control imaging utilization. Um, I and others in earlier sessions talked about what we can do to reduce dose from our scans. And in this, the remainder of this talk, I'll be talking primarily about what we can do after the scan. How can we capture patient or exam-specific exposure information and use it uh, for helpful purposes? Uh, to do that, um, it's important to recognize that the data that we have access to are primarily the volume CT dose index and the dose length product. These are metrics of X-ray tube output, but it's important to understand that they do not represent patient dose uh, itself. And as I showed in, in my earlier talk, uh, for a given CT technique, smaller patients actually receive larger organ doses than larger patients do because of internal shielding effects. Uh, the other effect that's very important to realize is that our scanners um, have some very sophisticated mechanisms to adjust our CT technique to the size of the patient. And tube current modulation is one way by which the scanner increases our X-ray exposures as needed in large patients to maintain a desired level of image quality. This has the result uh, that you see here where we have CTDI rapidly increasing for larger patients. Uh, this is appropriate variability and technique to achieve the image quality that we need to make the diagnoses we need to make. Now, all of the CT manufacturers produce these uh, dose screens where for each portion of the scan you can see we have a recorded CTDI vol and DLP. This is the GE version. Here's the Siemens version where again CTDI vol and DLP are uh, shown in the red boxes. This is the Toshiba version laid out differently but all the information is there in red. And here's the Philips screen. Uh, again, CTDI vol, DLP for each portion of the scan. Now, I encourage uh, all of our radiologists to look at these scans on each of the scanner, but it's interesting to think about how much data is already out there. And here's the result from looking at our PAC system. We saw a rapid increase in prevalence of these uh, records starting around 2006, and we're now at the point where almost all of our scans have these uh, patient protocol pages or, or CT dose screens that give us this information. So our scanners produce these dose screens and we can capture them in our image archive where our radiologists can look at them on individual patients as they're reading studies. Many of our more recent scanners also have the ability to create a DICOM SR or structured report um, uh, dose records which can be sent to a, a central archive. Uh, but rather than looking at these one at a time, uh, patient by patient, what we've really done and many others have done is develop tools to try to extract all this data uh, from our existing sources into a multi-dimensional database that we can then slice and dice in various ways to do interesting and hopefully useful things. And I'll show you some of those now. now the first thing we can do is we can use this data for institutional benchmarking. This is an example of the DLP distribution at four different facilities within our large organization. Uh, this is for abdomen pelvis CT scans. And you can see there's substantial variability between our different facilities here. This is an opportunity for standardization and for improvement where the technology allows. Here uh, I show an analytics uh, screen that we've built to allow us to interrogate this database uh, in any way we'd like. If we focus in on the uh, box plots here, this is now looking at the CTDI distributions of head CTs performed by different facility within our uh, enterprise. Uh, and as you can see, there's some variability which relates to differences in technology that we have at these different sites and also relates to different choices that we've made in how we perform these scans. If we look now uh, by scanner, these are the four scanners that do the most uh, head CTs at our place. And you can see, again, there's substantial variability here. Part of this 
is because we have newer technology in the ED scanner far to the right, which allows us to do these scans with lower dose. But nonetheless, there's still some variability here that's a target for possible optimization and standardization. Here we look at it by protocol name. So again, we have variability across protocols that we can address. If we look at one scanner, this is now just looking at our ER scanner, we can split apart this distribution to actually try to find the outliers contributing to the high and low ends of the distributions. And here, in the red oval, is four scans, the only four scans out of a thousand or so, performed with a CTDI vol above the ACR uh, diagnostic reference level of 75 milligray. Uh, and these all happen to be performed in patients whose shoulders came very high up into the scan, who had very thick calvarium resulting in tube current modulation giving us a, uh, a higher CTDI. At the low end of the distribution, we can see these patients. These were all repeats uh, performed just through the vertex where the anatomy was not fully covered. But the point is that we can drill down in any way we'd like into these outliers. You can see the details tab down at the, the bottom of our display where we can view images uh, on packs and really troubleshoot what's going on. I'll show a couple other examples. This is now all of our abdomen pelvis CTs on the same ER scanner distributed uh, against patient weight on the x-axis. And what you're seeing here is the expected behavior of tube current modulation increasing technique for our larger patients to maintain diagnostic image quality. But you can also see that even in some of our smaller patients, we have some outliers that need to be addressed. And this, uh, spreading this out by weight allows us a good way to find uh, appropriate outliers that need more attention. On the other hand, what this allows us to do very readily is have some comfort that the vast majority of our patients are being scanned below the 20 milligray uh, diagnostic reference level out there for ACR accreditation. And we can see from this at a glance that the vast majority of those patients exceeding that diagnostic reference level, as expected, are our very large patients. Here's uh, the corresponding curve for our PECTs. Um, and in addition to the outlier reasons that I just mentioned, some of these scans uh, performed with higher dose, even though they're listed as a low weight, actually turn out to be uh, poor uh, values for the selected weight where the technologist didn't uh, appropriately enter the actual patient weight. The next thing we can start to think about doing once we've extracted all of this data is we can look at the longitudinal records for a specific patient. This happens to be a patient with breast cancer who gets recurrent imaging almost every six months like clockwork, clockwork for restaging uh, uh, and to surveil for recurrence. Um, and what you see here is the accumulation of dose length product by different body parts. Now I put this dose in quotes because again I'm showing you here accumulated DLP, not patient dose. Here's another example, different patient with a history of HCC and intracranial aneurysm who has a very different pattern of DLP accumulation over time. But wouldn't it be nice to actually be able to see what this patient's actual doses were doing over time? In order to do this, we need several things. Not only do we need to capture the CTDI and DLP, but we need to try to convert it to a meaningful patient dose estimate. And to do that, we need to know what was the anatomy exposed and we need to correct for patient size because ultimately many of us feel we need to get to organ dose if we're going to think about anything patient-centric around radiation exposure. The AAPM in this uh, report uh, made great strides towards doing this by defining a, an effective diameter that can simply be measured off CT scans um, and using this to create normalized dose coefficients or correction values that can be multiplied by the CTDI to get to a number that more closely approximates the organ doses one would expect to see in a patient. So ultimately, where I'd love to see this go is if we can see, uh, calculate these sorts of cumulative uh, organ dose maps over time. This was work we actually did for nuclear medicine, but the concept could be the same for CT, where on the x-axis we have a timeline of CT exams. And if we capture the uh, x-ray tube output, CTDI, DLP, as lo uh, along with knowledge of anatomy exposed and the size of the patient, we should be able to calculate actual organ doses to the patient with reasonable accuracy, allowing us to plot these heat maps of organ dose accumulation over time from left to right. 
I think this will be a very useful technique if we get serious about doing patient-specific risk assessment um, or if we really want to try to look in detail at the uh, underlying risk models that we use in assigning radiation risk from CT dose. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the many collaborators I've been privileged to work with uh, in the informatics realm here, uh, and I'll be available for any questions. Thank you very much.